Are you listening? Well, what's up guys? Hopefully all of you are doing well. Today you're going to be helping me make my first quarter sheet cake. This is a quarter sheet cake actually. I had some new cake pans. I needed to test them out. I needed to see what was going to happen if I tried certain things and uh, we're just going to see what happens. Really quick, let's get some formalities out of the way. The red velvet cake video is going to be linked at the end of this video. The recipe I'm going to link down in the description so you can get that for yourselves. And then the cake pans that I'm using today are from Parrish's Cake Decorating in Gardena, California. We've talked about them before. <laughs> So the recipe I'm gonna be practicing with today is my red velvet cake recipe. I'm just showing you what's basically in it. I have some oil, buttermilk, cocoa powder. Um, I also have some sour cream in there. All good stuff, a little bit of coffee, really good recipe. It's really not overly sweet and I also provide the cream cheese frosting recipe for you also. When I'm testing out some new cake pans, I use a recipe that I already have and already exists. There's no time for creating a new recipe and then putting it in a new pan. Using an existing recipe will show you how those pans perform because obviously you've baked it in other pans before and it turned out okay. So that's why I do it like that. Okay, so here is my red velvet cake recipe times two. I've doubled the amount mix them in my large mixer and now I'm going to start to butter up my 9 by 13 by 2 inch pans. Now in some of my notes that I do keep, I couldn't find whether I liked using cocoa powder and red velvet together. I just could not find it and I said I know I've done it before but I didn't remember if I liked the results or not. So I said ah, no time like the present, let me give it a try and if I don't like it I won't do it anymore and I'll write it down so I can remember. So I just dusted the pan and then uh, tapped out the excess, that's what you do normally with flour. And I only did one pan like that. And then I did the other one as normal with the butter and the flour. If you guys have remembered, if you've watched any of my layer cake videos, I don't just randomly pour the batter into the pans because I can't gauge how much is in each pan uh, to make them even. So this is the way I do it. I do my pies this way also. I take a one cup measure and I go back and forth between the pans to make sure I have ex the exact amount in each one so the layers are even. So in this case, each pan has five and one thirds cup of batter. Another way to look at it is that one full cake recipe that would give you two nine inch rounds will fit in one nine by 13 by two. I preheated my oven at 350 degrees, just like the normal cake. However, I wanted to bake both layers at the same time. So I put one in the middle and then one on top. Knowing that it's hotter up there, I'm gonna have to pay close attention to that cake that's on the top to make sure I don't overcook it. It took about 40 minutes on top and the middle one took about 43 minutes. The cakes were done. The first one I took out, which was on top, was the one lined with the cocoa powder, and then I took out the other one layered with just butter and flour. I wanted to hurry up and unveil that one first because I wanted to see. And so what happened was a little bit came out or stuck to the pan, and then it made the cake darker. Another way to alleviate this from happening is take a piece of parchment paper and cut out the exact shape of the inside of your cake pan. And then you're going to follow that by cutting the piece of parchment up into the shape that you just made. And I cut past the pencil marks so you don't have any pencil marks next to your cake, so don't worry about that. And then just take your pan and fit it at the bottom of your pan. This can be square, this can be round, whatever. Go ahead and fit it and cut it to your liking. And then I'm just demonstrating how you would actually spray. I'm not actually spraying. I don't want to dirty up the pan. <laughs> but that's how you would fix that. But then I unveil the other one, and that let me know that was more of a cocoa powder situation than the pan or the moisture in the cake itself, because the other one turned out just fine. And here is a shot of the cake pan that I buttered and flour. See, it was clean. There was nothing left. So we'll just go with butter and flour with red velvet. And what the cocoa powder also did was made the cake darker on the edge. And here I'm just showing you the comparison. So if that doesn't bother you, fine. It didn't burn. If it had burned, I would have trimmed the cake on the sides. So now that the cakes are cool, I'm going to go ahead and take my square cardboards. You know, you guys have seen me work with the cake rounds before. They also come in squares. You get them at your baking supply shops. And I'm just taking my parchment paper and cutting them into the shape so that I can line the edge of the board so I don't mess them up too bad. And then go ahead and proceed to place the first layer down. And I'm going to put the cocoa um, cake layer on the bottom. Sometimes these cakes can be really moist. You have to be careful how you handle them. The bigger the cake layers get, the harder they are to handle too. So be careful and try not to break them. But that does happen. 
It's, you have accidents that happen. And matter of fact, it's going to happen to me a little bit, but I'll show you how to fix it. I'm just going to take about two and a half cups of cream cheese frosting and put that on the middle layer. And I, what I did, I cannot find my turntable. So I got my cake stand just to elevate the cake a little bit so I could get to it. And then I decided, you know, I really don't like this either. So I just got through the part of spreading the middle layer as even as possible. And then I took the cake off of that stand because I could see once I started to place that top layer on, I was like, oh my goodness, look what's happening. The weight of the cake changed and you got it on that stand. It was just not a good situation. So I said, let me take this off. And yeah, the cake is cracked right there, but you don't want to panic in situations like that because that's, it can be fixed. Don't worry about stuff like that. But I did take that cake off of that cake stand. Plus the cake stand wasn't completely flat either. So it wasn't helping me. I put it on my board on a flat surface and then just try to press out the excess frosting and then clean the sides up a little bit because you that's fine if it squeezes out the side. As a matter of fact, that's what you want because you need to fill in those edges. And then what we're gonna do is take the frosting and you're gonna spackle those cracks. That's how you get those cracks to close. Go ahead and put that frosting on there first and start to spackle, honey. So see, it's not that hard. You can fix things like that. And if you notice my left hand, I started to push the cake together while I put the frosting in those cracks so it can hold together. Not a big deal at all. Then just go ahead and proceed with your crumb coat. A crumb coat is just that. It's meant to catch all of the crumbs before you put the final outer layer of frosting on a cake. So I just did that. And here's where all my anxiety starts to come. And I start to get annoyed with baking at this point with the crumb coat actually on every cake. Y'all just don't know it. But I do because I'm like, Ugh, now square cakes have corners and you need to catch it just right. I'm like, okay, next time I'm not going to spread the frosting on the sides, I'm gonna pipe it, get it nice and thick, and then just shape it. That's what I'm gonna do next time. And that's what these kind of sessions are for, to see what you will do next time and what you won't do next time. <laughs> what I notice about myself, once I get to the top of the cake, it gets to be more therapeutic because now it's a flat surface, I can work with it a little better. So then I use this tool that my mom gave me, it's from Tupperware. And just to give me a little bit of lines on the side, nothing special. See that uh, the cake is peeking through at the top right there. Uh -uh. Yeah, I'll definitely use my piping tools. I'm going to put the nuts on top instead of on the sides because when you cut it, every piece will have some nuts. If you put it on the side, then when you cut the middle pieces, it won't have any nuts. So I just put some walnuts on top because they're cheaper. If I make the cake again and it's the final result, you know, I like that version. I will put pecans, but you know, walnuts are cheaper. You can get three pounds for $11 as opposed to two pounds of pecans for 15, you know. It's a practice cake, so, you know, you can take a little shortcut here. Not on the ingredients so much in the cake, but the nuts, go ahead. All in all, I'm happy with my sheet cake, my first one. This serves about 20 to 24 people, by the way. So if you do venture off into quarter sheet cakes and half sheet cakes, you can feed way more people with one cake instead of making multiple nine inch cakes. That would be up to you. I'm just, you know, I'm just seeing if I want to do it this way when I have to bake for more than what a nine inch will give me. Don't get it twisted. The recipe is still good. You can find this recipe and others at gdseasoning.com. Thank you guys so much for joining me. You know I appreciate it when you come cook with me and hang out. Be sure if you test recipes, send me pictures. If you guys are getting in there practicing, you know practicing is the key to becoming a better cook and a better baker. I am practicing what I preach. I will see you guys next time. <laughs>